Our next speaker is Volker Sorger, uh, professor at George Washington University. Uh, he's also the director of the Orthogonal Physics Enabled Nanophotonics Lab in George Washington University. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley. Uh, his research areas include optoelectronics, plasmonics, nanophotonics, including novel materials, optical information processing, and computing. Let's welcome Volker once again. Thank you very much, it's been a pleasure being here. And um, uh, Kim asked me to talk about scaling vectors for these electro-optic modulators. And um, that's what I'm gonna do. Um, we used, we are using, not used, we are using um, modulators for, uh, for data.com and we basically pull out this card here, this line card. We of course know that the current technology is at least right now is on the order of centimeters. It's rather a macroscopic uh, uh, device. Um, if we are, there are however other opportunities we can use modulators and I want to bring you, share one with you here today. Um, this is a slide that um, we are working together with, with, with Paul Prognall's group from Princeton University and we are essentially looking for what are the limits in computing in, um, and the idea here is, or this slide essentially shows um, found some fundamental limits um, in computing basically here. This is the digital like domain. This is what's, like, what's called the digital efficiency wall um, at about between one and 10 um, giga max per joule. So this is like a fundamental limit. And um, everything in photonics or RF in microwave or RF in photonics is, is basically on the right side. So in terms of speech, we can go beyond this because we're not limited by RC delays um, of my circuit. On the other hand, in terms of efficiency, power efficiency, there's an opportunity to go, like, to go above this fundamental wall. This is actually like, set by, basically by, by, by dissipated powers inside the circuit right now. And here are some examples from these sort of neuromorphic computer engines, these are analog, analog um, tape outs. What we're do, basically doing, we're doing this in a photonics domain, and um, essentially um, the Princeton group taped out already like the design in uh, using modulators here in silicon photonics and, um, and, and three phys with, with lasers. And essentially what I'm bringing to this now essentially is this uh, basically design that essentially brings it really to this um, to this challenge which basically SRC and, and NSF actually recently put out, which is basically one, um, one giga mag per second per nanowatt, basically one, um, one giga mag per, um, or 10 to the nine giga mag per joule, essentially. So um, for instance, just for one example, that you can also use modulators for something else than simply like, like, like Datacom is basically shown here. Um, this is essentially an optical perceptron. This is an optical neuron, essentially. Um, how neurons work is you have, you have multiple inputs basically coming in. I think this is maybe better on this one. If multiple um, basic inputs coming in, they are all weighted. And essentially then they are sort of summed up. And you of course see the sum essentially is in, like is it a photo detector. The weighting you can do with spectral banks, essentially like, this is like these are like tunable rings. And then essentially like, you need to produce like, a nonlinear function. And there you can either use lasers or for instance, again, electro-optic modulators. And this is basically where you can possibly also use these um, optical um, or photonic neurons that basically we're designing um, in my lab. Um, so how do EOM scale fundamentally? Um, you have two options. So fundamentally, photonics and electronics, or photons don't interact strong with matter. Um, it has two reasons, or basically simply one reason. The, the photon is on the order of 10, to, like let's say the wavelength, like 1,000 nanometer. The wavelength of an atom is basically, one, it's, the, it's the wave function, it's one nanometer, so that's three orders of magnitude different. They don't interact strongly. That's why you, the modulars we have been talking about just now, they're great, but they are on the order of millimeters. Unless I use a ring, unless I use a ring, and I fold back the signal Q times, and basically now, of course, I can, um, I can have some sort of enhanced interaction by, for instance, time in this case. The other option is I can essentially take the photon, um, the wavelength, and simply sort of squeeze it down to match that of my, of my, of my electron um, in my matter better, and therefore I have some interaction. This is the whole field of sort of plasmonics, or we can call it polaritonics. Polaritonics means a matter-like wave. So you simply play this transformer action essentially, and here's an example of a silicon hybrid um, photonic plasmon mode. So fundamentally you have two options, Q up or mode volume down, and both basically work. However, Q up has some fundamental challenges. You have a narrow bandwidth, of course. 
Um, you need possibly heaters, as we discussed. Um, energy goes up, speed possibly goes down, because again, these heaters might be slow. You, again, you like delay might be, also like your photon delay, your photon might be staying long inside the cavity, which basically fundamentally like limits your, your remodulation. On the other hand, um, this mode, there's basically no cavity really here, essentially, it can be broadband. This device, as we will show, can, this type of devices can be, can be very compact, and, and, and we're crazy talking about a few microns, that's it. Um, the energy, therefore, the RC delay is, uh, is short. That means energy is, uh, like the device is fast and the energy can be um, below one femtojoule per bit from a device only. Modulator is a device. Uh, light goes in, gets modulated out. It's a capacitor. You apply voltage um, across a certain distance, H here, let's say height. If you um, essentially put, put the one half uh, CV squared formula, this is a capacitance, this is simply like the, like the width times the length. You plug this essentially the C in here. And then for the critical field, this is, this is the field you need to switch to get your like, desired extinction ratio. That's simply the voltage over this height. You plug this in here into, for the voltage, which goes in squared, of course. And notice what H squared over H, one H cancels. You basically can pull out all these factors here. And these are, this is simply the physical volume of your device. So you reduce the volume, you re, basically your energy per bit goes, uh, basically goes down. Notice also there is a Q down here, in fact, Q squared. And um, there's essentially this factor we, um, before, which I effectively have not exactly mentioned, but these two set up a ratio. This is a fundamental ratio. This is called Purcell effect. This is something Edward Purcell um, um, found in 1946. And he like, developed this for MRIs at that, like, at that time. So this actually found this, this magical factor here again. You see it's volume over Q squared. So it's one over Purcell times one over Q. So Q helps a little bit more. So what we then recently did is we basically um, wrote a paper and took, for example, three classical cavities, ring, uh, uh, a ring cavity, a linear um, Fabi Perot, and a plasmonic cavity. And we asked, what's the Q factor? What's the mode volume setting up this Purcell factor here as a function of scaling? And these are basically color coded here, as you can see. And then we, uh, then we implemented this inside an EOM model and basically ask how good is the EOM as a function of scaling, physical scaling of this critical dimension, here the radius, here the length, and here the radius again. This is a plasmonic particle, essentially. And what we essentially find, it tracks again this one over FP times Q reasonably well. So for instance, here, simply we're showing that essentially it matches this Purcell, the peak of the Purcell matches the minimum of the energy per bit reasonably well, basically. Of course, there's another Q factor in here, that's why it's not exactly matched. Notice also that the, um, the minimum point for the, um, for the energy for the classical ring resonator is for, for rings that are a little bit smaller than 10 micron radius. This is exactly, of course, what Mike Watts um, um, has been demonstrated like a few years ago in his like sub micron or like a few micron like modulator, which is basically it's this optimum point exactly around here. Uh, we can go smaller. We can we, we can we, we can make devices on the order of uh, several hundreds of nanometers. Um, theoretically, um, we will give up a little bit of energy, but we can get reasonably small overall. Can a cavity help fundamentally? The answer is yes. Um, the way it works essentially, again, you fold back your signal and we can ask, for instance, how about footprint? So if you take a certain footprint um, from a cavity, let's say linear here or folded back, which basically gets like scales with, of course with Q, you can ask how much um, longer, how much more footprint essentially do we save if we go from, an, from a linear device to a to an, uh, to an Q folded device? And the ratio basically is shown here. If you go through the numbers, essentially we come up with essentially the, uh, the efforts are over full of half maximum, which is actually the definition of the finesse. So you win by the finesse in terms of footprint. This is fundamental. So you have a finesse of 10, basically that's, that's basically how much you win. Um, material and mode, um, this is basically how every modulator basically scales. Um, the effective index is to be maximized, has three factors, number one, you can, let's say, like starting with the middle one is the easiest one. You have your index of your material switches more or changes more. Of course, you get more, more switching. If that material does not overlap with the optical mode, well, then you don't win. So you need to make sure the overlap is high. In photonic device, it's given is usually 100%. But in a possible with new materials, with two-dimensional two materials, this might be very low. So you need to take care of this. And the other one, of course, is we also might have a slow light effect, like essentially like a high group index, which also helps. Um, to show this as an example, everything on the left here is silicon. This is in TCO, a transparent conductive oxide, and this is graphene. Everything on the left essentially was what we talked about this morning, um, and I guess graphene, uh, like germanium, is a little different because it's a Franz Keller effect. This is basically a plasma dispersion, 
This is, this is basically carriers here, where you inject carriers. But notice, essentially, even if you change the, like the carrier concentration here, it changes really only by very little, essentially. So therefore, our electroplating modulators are millimeter long. If I have now, for instance, an, an, an ITO, and I bias it in such a capacitor that, that I essentially get in capacit like in, uh, in accumulation mode right here, it turns out we can change the index by, um, by two orders of magnitude, and that my effective index change, therefore, is, um, uh, is much, much stronger. So for instance, here I have a more than unity index change in the real part, and a factor of over, over 10 to the 2 in the, in the imaginary part. So now I can design interesting modulators, which essentially are two or possibly three orders of magnitude smaller because I, like, I need less accumulation length. Graphene is also very interesting. There's this, like, the effect called polyblocking. This is a band structure. What you do basically, you modulate this Fermi level here from here to up here. Once the Fermi level is here in the middle, essentially you can have transition from here up here because the states are empty up here. In this case, the states are filled, they're blocked, meaning, meaning you cannot absorb. That's basically how the system works. And this is done essentially by voltage control. Um, you sweep simply the thermal level, electrostatic doping effectively. Um, and the index change is also very dramatic. You see here the like, real part, imaginary part. Again, modern unity, you have a very strong index change. Notice, however, that in this case now, the effective material of your cross-sectional mode, you can change it essentially by the entire mode. Let's say something on order of lambda. In this case, my accumulation layer is just a few nanometers thick, let's say 10 nanometer, which means now I'm limited to, in, I have a small overlap now, and here it might be even worse. I only have one nanometer or so. So of course, that this brings to the, the, the question, how does, how does the actual mode change? This is a paper we wrote, and we looked into um, the actual index change or the actual modulation performance. So up is good as a function of mode overlap for these three different um, materials for three specific modes in this case. And you see here, even if you have a photonic mode, in silicon we need almost 100%, that's all the way to the right, so almost 100% uh, in like a mode overlap to get a reasonably high switching, which is still not that high compared to these other materials. So it turns out if we switch to these very exotic materials, effectively we need a lot less overlap um, to, get, um, to get a mo like much more effect of, of, of switching. So we have two design rules here, two vectors essentially. We can use a photonic mode, which has a very basic unity high or at least 50% high overlap factor. Uh, my index change fundamentally is limited. However, um, and my group index might be in the mid-range because we have high index materials. Plasmonics or anything polaritonic, essentially, we have probably a lower or maybe even a relatively low, depending on the amount of material, overlap factor. Um, my, unit, my index change can be unity, at, in fact, very strong, but uh, and my group index can be also reasonably high. And here are two examples, basically, from our paper, which right now is pending, um, and where we basically show where we sort of map this entire like, uh, basic equation out. Um, another example we can, uh, we can look into is using, for instance, a graphene, one of these very exotic materials, of course, for, for, for this community. Here's a previous device which essentially shows, uh, here's the modulation. It's an EAM, an absorption modulator. The, the um, a blue curve basically shows the, um, the absorption modulation. Here's a function of chemical potential, meaning voltage. And essentially, this is the device. They take two, de like, like two films, bias one against the other one. Essentially, they see this sort of like switching here. And what we simply then did is we improved upon this device by changing this mode from, from a photonic to a plasmonic mode, meaning we, we used one of these electrical contacts here to define the optical modes and to contact the graphene at the same time. This essentially helped us um, reducing the contract resistance, and we improved uh, basically on the electrostatics of this gate oxide, and that essentially allowed us to have, to have a modulator which is basically sub one volt in terms of um, like switching. So um, that's interesting. Um, here's, here are, um, is a bit of an overview, um, the particular device design on the left here, um, the actual device. Um, this is all tapered on, on silicon and basically co-integrated or hybrid integrated. Um, this is the optical most cross section, like, like, like cross section. These are all some sort of photonic or, or um, like plasmonic modes. The transfer functions and essentially here the energy per bits for these uh, like for, like for our devices in units of femtojoule. So we're really trying to get basically sub femtojoule um, from these like for these devices. So performance. Um, here's the other Moore's law, which I'm personally very interested in. It's basically the um, what is the energy per bit to switch a signal. And for instance, here is our good old friend the FET. Oops, the wrong one. Uh, good old friend the FET which um, 
uh, essentially is shown right here. This is the gates only. And if you, if, and if you look at the gates only for like these various like technology nodes here, essentially we're seeing we, we, can, we can get up to, now here's an interesting unit. This is the energy, and this is so, uh, basically in KT. So in fundamental units of Boltzmann constant times temperature, this is for 300 um, like Kelvin. And just to give you a feel for it, um, essentially one KT, so KT is 10 to minus 23, 300K, so basically like you're 10 to 21, 10 to minus 21, that's basically 1.1% of actual, of 10 to 8, like minus 18, so essentially we're down to like this very, very small number. Um, FETs right now give us about um, 4 added joule of the actual energy per bit, so uh, like a device by itself. But if we add the wire, of course, then essentially we are, we are losing two orders of magnitude because we have this, like, these, uh, these, these, these fringe capacitances. This is something Gordon Moore knew already because well, like when he said in 1963, the technology limit of this will be the charging, discharging of wires. He knew that already. So, and you see it actually explicitly here. If we now overlap, for instance, just for example, a few devices that, that, that we have made in my group, essentially we see the, uh, like the details here. This is our, our ITO device, this is a graphene device, and then this is basically an optimized graphene device. These are always experimental devices here. Um, we can almost approach this, this limit. And this is basically in, in proposed device, which we are now designing, where we essentially use a small cavity to, um, to bring it into the tens of joules per bit. If the question now is, if I have a photonic device which is as good as an electronic device now to generate my data, what is the real advantage? Um, so for instance, again, with equal energy per bit, the, the performance improvement essentially would be probably on the order of like maybe 50 times in terms of speed, because now I do, I do not need to um, charge my entire wire. I get my, my, like my full 50 gigahertz basically on my signal, and possibly some WDM. Um, and of course, this entire region is blocked because it's basic temperature is made, unless I cool my system. So the design rules for modulator essentially are like this. I have energy constraints, speed constraints. So the FOM essentially is speed over energy times area. Um, so I have electrical constraints for both and optical constraints for both. And the electrical constraints, of course, we know all of them. One have CV squared and one over RC, but the optical constraints are also there. Optically, for instance, essentially the, is my effect, it's, which means my switching. Uh, for my modulator, this is basically breaks down into these three components. It's basically called optical power penalty. So I have my on-off state, um, um, my on-state loss. Uh, I have my on-off averaging loss, which is the average loss at the, my photodetector sees downstream from my EOM. And then I have basically my DC static like extinction ratio loss here. So all of them I need to take care of, and essentially they form a trade-off against all the other ones. Because what I can do, I can make my device smaller or use less, less voltage. If it goes smaller, my speed goes up. And if I have a lossier cavity, my speed also goes up. So these three form a trade-off basically with this one. So and that's, of course, that's after this fundamental challenge that we are playing here. So to show a bit of an uh, overview, also again, in like in the interest of history, this is um, a slide I'm, like we made recently. This is still in preparation, so there might be still a few numbers shifting a little bit uh, like left and right. But essentially, in the past, of course, or still until, I guess, until today, we use these photonic. So like the way this like 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 this decodes. This is um, uh, this is the type of active device, and this P is basically photonic, or maybe it could be like a plasmonic kind of like, the, like, like mode, so this is the actual material, the mode, and then here is basically shown the performance in gigabits per second per femtojoule per micrometer squared. So essentially it's my, it's my performance area from before. So a classical silicon device that we can tape out right now sits essentially down here. If we use a cavity, we already win by two orders of magnitude, and if we switch from silicon, the active material, to anything but silicon, like graphene, polymers, TMDs, I need to add to graphene, uh, the germanium actually, that would be very interesting now in fact. Um, we, for instance, Lipson's work already jumps then from here to here, so she wins already a few orders of magnitude just by using a silicon ring and putting graphene here, which is interesting. If we, however, use a silicon, like a linear ring, and optimize the mode, we can already get to this one. This is Jörg Leuthold's uh, like, like work from ETH, um, so, um, or like, like, that's the, um, like back in the day from KIT. This is essentially a polymer-based uh, device, very, very, very fast. Um, um, and then basically like a plasmonic type of device. And with these graphene devices, we can actually like get to these regimes all the way up here. This, however, is an interesting device, actually. This is um, the one from Mike Watts, where he essentially went to this optimum cavity scaling point. Um, it's a pure silicon device, and then he also optimized his, like, his carrier injection. 
So this is something to, uh, I thought was very interesting in this, like in the scaling law. And lastly, before I close, um, this is um, a bit of a power, a power band of scaling vectors, a um, bit of a zo like zoom out. So essentially right now, with many of these devices that we tape out right now, we're sitting sort of in this quadrant. So this is the energy per bit, um, which directly maps, of course, the numbers of photons per bit. So right now we're using on the order of like tens to maybe hundreds, so sub, basically sub picojoule per bit, right? Right now, essentially. Um, and we're trying, to, like, we're trying to drive this down now into like the one, like the one femtojoule, essentially, per bit. On the other hand, um, the device has, it needs a certain length to accumulate my signal, so my length is on the order of maybe a few millimeters, millimeters, micrometers, nanometers, this is how this reads. This, of course, gives me a fundamental capacitance, an RC delay, which is basically shown down here. So I'm, I'm sort of living in this quadrant up here, basically, or like in, this, like, like in this sort of fuzzy area up here. And that, of course, gives me a fundamental limit also in terms of or, or, or like an um, amount of energy that's burned at a DC power, which means the, um, the, if I multiply the left axis by the bottom axis, I get, a, I, get, I get joules per bits, bits per second. I get basically joule per second, which is watts. So, I'm, so basically, we're monitoring how much power is actually burned in DC. And um, now, if, I, if we're in this quadrant up here, or like in this regime, I'm essentially, we're burning on the order of, and these are ISO power control lines, we're burning about a milliwatt per device. Which means if we wanted to get to a large scale integration, guess what, we can't, because we would need too much power. So essentially, we can integrate 1,000 devices, and then on the order of one watt, and maybe I can make 10,000 devices, and I would need 10 watt, and then I run out of juice on my laptop, essentially. So the idea would be we need to really do something and here's a scaling vector which I'm proposing essentially, or which at least my, 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 my research group is focusing on. We're really trying to move from this one to this field down here where we now use maybe one microwatt per device. And we are able to uh, basically drive the devices under sub femtojoule per bit regime and possibly RC delay pushed us out maybe into the 100 plus gigabits per second or so. I'm still warning from staying away from quantum because then essentially um, signal to noise ratio, like, like issues on the data com will really be, an, I guess, have more challenges than, 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 than what we have included right here. In order to do this, however, we need to do this Q over V, this per cell factor, we need to actually bring it up to 10 to 100, elsewise we cannot win. Um, so this is basically a summary of this. So we, we should reduce energy per bit, bring a volume down, improve electrostatics. New materials can allow us to um, have very high switching, but we need to watch out the Kramers chronic relations, something in physics, because when you change the index, you change the loss as well, so they are coupled, and then that there's some, some, some fundamental material science to be done here. We can engineer a high effective index by using these three um, like components up here. And again, fundamentally, a um, EOM scales with one over per cell factor times one over Q. So Q and per cell helps, but of course we have to watch bandwidth um, for this as well. So um, basically, in my mind, an EOM is nothing else but an optical FET. <laughs> and um, I think electrostatics is important, so th think sub-threshold swing, right? That's, that's the holy grail on an like, on FET. So that's basically all these, tricks from F like, all these tricks we learn from FETs basically help here as well, effectively. Um, so the state of the art essentially is that one lower than one femtojoule per bit are possible. And um, what we're doing now, I guess, is uh, us cut off. <laughs> We are we're going to 100 adder per bits, the type of modulators. Thank you. <laughs>